Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, we will move forward with the first part of the uh, sort of setting the table, which is looking at structural uh, issues that underlie the, the policy uh, concerns that affect the strengthening of Latino families. So we'll begin with uh, Dr. Rogelio Sainz, who is Dean of the College of Public Policy, uh, who will address the Latino demography and socioeconomic standing. Uh, Dean, thank you. So what we'll start off with now is looking at the realities, the demographic reality. And I talked about that demo demography that uh, is working towards uh, the empowerment of Latino, the potential empowerment of Latino, Latinos, and also the socioeconomic reality. So these are kind of uh, the, some of the opportunities and particularly pointing out some of the challenges uh, that, uh, that we have. Hopefully you can see a little bit. But, uh, I'm going to be talking about the paradox of Texas, which I'll describe in a little minute, in a minute. And that is the, also the reality of the Texas political world, the historical and contemporary efforts to, that we have found to minimize Latino political power and socioeconomic resources. And then the, really the paradox is the demographic overview of the Latino population, that we see a lot of favorable signs of Latino population growth, but at the same time, challenges towards uh, Latino political representation. And then another, the other side of the paradox, the socioeconomic standing of the Latino population, and in particular, the lagging socioeconomic uh, standing of Latinos nationally on uh, uh, many dimensions and indicators, and finish up with the policy uh, challenges. So the paradox of Texas, as it concerns Latinos, is that on the one hand, Texas is a national leader in the demography of its national uh, of its uh, Latino population. We're the second largest uh, Latino population in the in the country, behind uh, California, in terms of population growth. La one year, five years, ten years, we're the leader in terms of the most population growth in the Latino population here in the state of Texas. Yet on the other hand, Texas is below average and in, may, in many cases way below average uh, with respect to socioeconomic standing of its Latino uh, population on many, many measures. And I will make this uh, PowerPoint available so you don't have to be joining everything uh, real fast. That'll be available. Okay, the reality of the, tex of the tele Texas political world, this is the reality in which we live in. And we try to say, well, ya no importa tanto eso, but it is a part of, uh, of the reality the historical background that created and established Latinos as a proletariat population that was situated at the bottom, the lo loss of land and the making of the pro proletariat uh, workforce. But David Montejano, historian, uh, has uh, talked about the second class citizenship of uh, Latinos here in the state of Texas, the violence, including lynching, that uh, oftentimes is not taught, and it is not taught in K through 12 system, the separate and unequal schools, the Mexican schools that we had, and the disenfranchisement and, and poll tax of the Latino population. So all those are early ingredients then to keep Latinos down. Uh, and, and then there was a particular period, the civil rights era, where we saw some temporary social, economic, and political gains that occurred during the 1960s and 1970s as soon as the, the, uh, the power structure realized ways that they could get around this and in this, uh, they did. And we see the undoing of civil rights gains beginning with the Reagan administration and that have continued today. And now as the Latino population has grown, uh, we have the contemporary Latino impending majority minority era. That is a time when Latinos are the uh, major part of the state of Texas and its future, and we've seen the system, uh, systemic efforts to minimize Latino political power and their socioeconomic standing. So let's take a look at the demographic overview of the Latino population, and here these are the optimistic signs that we see. The growth that has taken place in a very short period of time between 1980 and 2015, over 35 years, you can see the in red the Latino population more than tripling at that particular time from about 3 million to about 10.7 million. At the same time in yellow, you can see very, very slow growth of the white population. 
So this is kind of the demographic trends that we see in, uh, in the state of Texas. With, with respect to, to the uh, representation, uh, the share of the uh, Latino population, that is, uh, the Texas population that is Latino, we can see the growth that has taken place in red from about one out of every five uh, Texans being Latino in 1980 to almost two out of every five, 39% in, uh, in 2015. At the same time, with the aging of the pop white population and the uh, youthfulness of the Latino population, you see whites losing ground, demographic ground, from being two-thirds of the population, 66%, down to 43%. It is only a matter of years that, uh, that Latinos will come to them, become the demographic majority in the state of Texas. And this has been due very much to the age sex structure, the youthfulness of the Latino population and the aging of the white population. On the left is what demographers use, the age sex pyramids, and you have a, 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 along the vertical axis up and down age groups represented from zero to four all the way to 85 and older, and at the bottom, the percentage of the overall population uh, in a particular group, so females, for example, in red, zero to four represent about 4.3% of the overall Latino population. You can see a white base uh, demonstrating the very youthful nature of the Latino population. On the other hand, on the right, you have the white population, which is an aging population. No longer do you have the bars at the four, uh, over four, you have bars that are just uh, above 2%. So the aging white population. And this has major implications for the future of the demography of Texas. And this is a reality that we see that really impacts public policy making in the state of Texas. Whites and, and Latinos are two very different populations. In the case of at age 40 and older, the yellow is a, is a, it signifies a, a white population that is a majority in those age groups. In red, that's where the Latino population is the majority. So at ages less than 40, you can see the, the, the power of the Latino population in red. If we see then, uh, oftentimes we want to see, you know, there's these demographic shifts that are taking place. The Democratic Party at the national level says Democrats, the, the demographics will take care of that. We don't need to worry about that. But in reality, we have forgotten uh, the, 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 the white growth in, uh, in Texas, which is what I call the forgotten part of the empowerment equation. And uh, the people say, well, look, it happened in California. California was a red state, and in a relatively short period of time, it has become blue. Why doesn't that happen in Texas? Uh, and part of the reason is, and what we're going to do here is looking at the uh, voting age population, uh, citizen population, and uh, we can see in, in the year 2000, there were about 60% of both populations of California and Texas. The citizen population of voting age were about 60% were, uh, were white in California and Texas, and but the similarities in there. In, there. in the period between 2000 and 2015, we can see that in, in uh, California, the voting age white population decreased by about 120,000 in Texas. It, increased by approximately one million. Okay, so you can see, uh, and part of that, why we see Texas continuing being a red state versus California is these kind of uh, patterns that we find. We can also find with the child population, for example, in California, uh, during uh, the, this uh, period 2000 to 2015, there were about 20, one fourth less children, white children in the state of California in Texas, there was a reduction because of the aging of the white population in Texas, but only a 7% reduction. In migration, state, interstate migration, this is another one. In California, whites are moving out of California. Over that particular 15 year period, uh, there was a net out migration. There were 745,000 more whites than left California than entered. In contrast, in the state of Texas, there were 418,000 more whites that moved into the state than moved out. So this is part of the challenge that we see in the, the question, why hasn't Texas become blue like California? And what we see is these 14 states, uh, including California, are states where you have more deaths, white deaths, than you have white, uh, white births. And California, this has been going on since about 1998, 1999. So this is a demographic reality. 
We've also depended very heavily on our numbers to continue to increase, but they have been slowing down, and not only slowing down, they've been slowing down significantly. We can see in the earlier points in time, in the 1990s, between 1990 and 2000, the Latino population was growing 5% each year, 5% during the, uh, the decade, 54% growth. Now, in 2010 to 2015, it's about close to 3%, 2.6%. It is a very slow growth. At the same time, you've seen a slight increase in the growth of the white population. And we've also seen the further complications having to do with political barriers that Republicans have erected to minimize Latino and, and uh, 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 Latino political power. Uh, direct measures of voter ID laws, the disingenuous uh, drawing of redistricting maps, uh, and indirect measures of slashing the public uh, education funding. Uh, in the 2011 legislature, $5.4 billion at the time that Latino children were becoming the majority in schools. And we've seen the mass incarceration which has taken away the vote of many people of color. But there is an opportunity. There is still an opportunity here. In the state of Texas in 2015, uh, there were 3.5 million children, less than, than uh, 18 years of age, which signifies that every year, 197,000 are turning age 18. And most of these, 95, 96% were born in the United States, and they're eligible to vote. Every month, 16,400 turn 18. Every day, 541. And since I've been talking, about 4.8 children have uh, turned age 18. So this is an opportunity, an opportunity to engage these youngsters, to uh, register them, and to vote. Now let's take a look at the socioeconomic standing of the Latino population. And the data analysis, for those of you uh, uh, looking at the, checking what the credentials are of the study, this comes from the 2015 American Community Survey Public Use Microdata Sample. And it's taking Texas, for example, as a base and ranking it relative to other states. And Juan and I did a study about two years ago, Juan, uh, and this is kind of an update on that, um, so that we look at r rankings having to do one with the most favorable, where Latinos are the most favorable, let's say, education. 51 is the, the least favorable. And then we have measures here for children, the percent of children, three and four year olds, that are in preschool, uh, the percentage of 14 to 17 year olds that are still in high school or have already graduated from high school, that is, they are not dropouts, uh, the percent of children 0 to 17 with health insurance coverage, and the percentage of children seven, 0 to 17 uh, below pover uh, above poverty line, so put all in a favorable measure uh, direction here. For the adult measures, uh, the percent of householders or homeowners, the percent of the population 25 and older that have a bachelor's degree or higher, the number of STEM majors uh, per 1,000 people in the labor force, and the percentage of workers that are working full time, the median household income, and then uh, health care coverage as well as being above, above poverty. These are the results here. These are for children here that have those four measures, and they're the column that has Latino, there's a ranking. And you can see that, te that Texas, with respect to Latino children, ranks 30th when it comes to, uh, to the percentage of kids three and four that are in preschool. It ranks 32nd in, uh, in the percentage of kids 14 to 17 that are still in school or high school graduates. It ranks 45th with respect to uh, children having health care insurance. And it ranks 28th when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to being above poverty. Overall, with those four, the ranking is about, the average is about 34. That means that 33 states overall tend to be doing better with respect to the socioeconomic status of their children. And we can see for the other two groups, major groups, white, whites and blacks, they also have challenges as well. But you can see that the, the rankings aren't as high as the case of Latino children. Uh, and in the case of whites, even though we're talking about 48th in terms of, uh, compared to other whites, in terms of uh, insurance, 94% uh, have insurance compared to 87% for, for Latino children. We see similar results for the case of the, uh, of the adult population. For Latinos, uh, one where we do find favorable, if we compare Latinos here in the state of Texas to Latinos elsewhere, is in percent householders who are homeowners. 
56% are homeowners. Only two other states do better. But look at the white population, 70% versus 50, uh, 58%. Uh, in bachelor's degree, we rank 37th. In STEM majors, uh, 32nd. In uh, full-time employment, Texas, full, everybody's working, right? 30, uh, fourth place even, but we still are not out of poverty. Median health goal, so 20th. And health insurance uh, coverage, 43rd. And above poverty, 21. Here, the average ranking for Latinos is 23 compared to 18.6 for white and 19.9 for blacks. So that it suggests that even though we're doing much worse than, uh, than other Latinos throughout the, the country, we're also doing worse than the white population, significantly worse, and uh, in some cases also worse than the African American population. And some of the rankings that we see, because you see some of the differences between gender uh, for, uh, for Latinos, uh, females rank a little bit uh, worse than uh, Latino males, 25 to about 23. Uh, and then uh, particularly uh, foreign-born females, adults, 29th is their, their ranking. So the policy challenges that after going through this presentation, we can see the Latino growth of Latinos continues to be faster than that of whites. Uh, but still, in contrast to California, the white growth is a formidable kind of growth as we've seen. Uh, and there has also been the slowing Latino population growth. So we can't uh, uh, rely only that demographics is going to take care of us. And then the Texas uh, Latino socioeconomic standing, middle of the pact, uh, or worse nationally. Here we, t we tend to fare worse nationally relative to other racial and ethnic uh, peers, as well as whites and blacks in the state of Texas. And the policy challenges here, if we look at children, and those four indicators, there is not one indicator that is positive. All of them are negative, and in particular, preschool enrollment, health uh, insurance coverage, and poverty. If we highlight the, uh, the case for Latino adults, the only positive one is nationally the way we compare to other Latinos with respect to home ownership, but it's negative if we compare to white 70 versus 56 percent. And we also fare very badly when it comes to health insurance coverage, college education, STEM, and, uh, and poverty. So you can see, again, the ingredients at the top in terms of where we are going with our children. If things don't change, it's going to be the recreation of that generational poverty that we see, the generational unemployment, the generational uh, lack of health insurance, the generational lack of housing, and so forth. And to give you an idea how much we really are behind when it comes to STEM fields, for example, these are the number of STEM majors. These are individuals who are in the workforce. They majored in one of the STEM fields. And per 1,000 people in the labor force, you can see white males are at the top. For every 1,000 uh, whites in the labor force, there are 123 that have a, a diploma that is a STEM field. Black males follow with about 56, followed by white females, 48. And then we finally get to Latinos, Latino foreign born uh, males, 38, Latino native born males, 37. And we go down the line and we can see that uh, females, Latina fam uh, females, are particularly way at the bottom in the case of uh, uh, Latinas, 19 and 17 being the STEM, the STEM rates. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and end it here. Thank you very much, uh, Rogelio. So moving on, uh, the next area uh, that presents structural challenges is in the, the way that the, the budgets, the pro budget priorities are made in Austin. So we're very fortunate to have Eva de Luna Castro, who's uh, with the Center for Public Policy Priorities, and she's the State Budget Analyst and Program Director for Invest in Texas. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, and um, and we were asked to just set the table here, so you're not going to hear everything there is to know about the state budget, but um, but enough uh, enough to understand uh, the the challenges for education, healthcare, labor force, all the all the areas that we're going to cover in the, the remainder of the symposium. Uh, again, my name is Eva Luna Castro, and I've been a budget analyst 
1991, technically. Um, I worked for uh, Ramon Martinez, a state representative from Houston, um, when I was a graduate student at the LBJ School. So I came to Texas in 1990. He was on the redistricting committee and House Appropriations in 1991, so that's where I got my first exposure to the Texas state budget. Uh, that also turned out to be the last time that Texas had a major state tax increase. So 1991 is a long time uh, for Texas to go as far as putting more on that table that we're, that we're setting, setting the table for. Uh, so the tax and budget conversation really is inviting more and more people to be at that table and taking away more and more food. It's really, you're going to see in, in a bit how that, that works out um, to the detriment of what we can do for Latinos and for all Texans. Every, every family in Texas deserves access to education and, and health care. Uh, what Texas has done in our tax system is make it harder and harder to do that. And the proposals this session don't really change that. And they also kind of get in the way of local government's ability to do that. So again, just some quick highlights. Uh, there's a discussion paper in your packet. There will be a few more slides here that aren't in there, but just kind of, again, setting the, the, setting the table. Um, the, uh, the Center for Public Policy Priorities, for those of you who've never heard of us, uh, was um, created by the Bernie um, Benedictine Sisters. And they originally wanted um, to shift from providing direct health care through their nursing homes and clinics to shaping health care policy in Austin. So we started off as a branch of the Benedictine Resource Center, and we've been we've been working still mainly on healthcare. That's always been a big priority for us, but also education, school finance, um, uh, economic opportunity covers that whole area, um, and then um, health and wellness has included nutrition programs, uh, SNAP, and, and other uh, school meals. And then I, me and Dick Levine work on uh, tax and budget issues. So I'm glad to be here this morning and uh, this afternoon to talk to you all about this. Um, so this kind of sums up um, the big, big picture, and I do start at 1993 because that's this is basically starting with the last time that Texas really tried to do more to get more tax revenue on the table, and it wasn't really because the legislature felt like being being nice about it. Uh, 1990 was right after a lot of the big um, prison lawsuits and school finance lawsuits. So those of you who've been working on school finance and school equity know. Early 90s is really when Texas first started to do something about about the main thing that the state tries to, to fund, public schools. So 1991, we saw a state sales tax increase, uh, change in the state gasoline tax. The gasoline tax um, raises money not just for highways, but also for public schools. And then um, those, those two are really the major shifts. Um, and so in 1993, if you look at the, the, the axes on, on the um, uh, right side here, Taxes as a share of all the money that, that people in Texas have was about uh, 5%. So 5% of all the money being made in Texas in income was going to pay for state taxes. By 2017, uh, which is where we are now, it's dropped to a little below 4%. And, uh, and, and you might think, well, that's only a 1% drop. That can't really make that much of a difference in, in how the state provides public services. A 1% drop in personal income, all, all the income that we all make from our jobs and from, from uh, investments, turns out to be $14 billion a year. So the way that Texas writes its budget, uh, how much money would be available every two years is how we think about that. Almost $28 billion more would have been available for our schools, higher education, health care. Um, all of all of the things that the state has to provide, all the new things that it decided to take on, like border security, and $28 billion would go a huge way to changing the discussion that's happening in Austin right now. Uh, we would not be seeing a $6 billion increase in our local property taxes for schools. We would be having a very different conversation about how to allocate. I mean, there would still be scarce dollars, don't get me wrong. Texas spends very little compared to other states, but that would really change things. Instead, what we've done, our economy has changed in a way that doesn't make our tax system work as well, and then legislators have actually cut state taxes repeatedly. So that's what's been happening. At the same time that the Latino share of the population rises, there's a little kind of hitch here in 1999. I'm sure the other, the other expert here could tell me that I probably use one data source up to 1999 and then another one for 2000 on. But, but about 40, almost 40% 40 of the, the population in Texas will be 
um, Mexican American, Mexican, every all the, everybody that makes up the Latino uh, population, almost 40 percent. So steady increase. A lot of that driven by the birth rate. And then, um, meanwhile, taxes as a share of our income is going steadily down. That other gray line that you see there is all the money that the state has. Federal, state, highway funds, all the money that the state allocates through the budget. That's gone from about um, almost 8% of the economy. They were measuring as a share of the economy, North State product. It's dropped to about 6.5%. That, that little, that little um, uh, peak that you see, only the Recovery Act in, in, the, in 2009, 10, 11, did a little more for Texas just for those few years, but otherwise it's been a steady, steady downturn. That again, that's a result of state tax cuts and the legislature just choosing to do things like um, uh, provide fewer and fewer services. Again, just just as Roger said, just at the time when when we need these institutions to do more, the legislature is making a, a conscious choice to put us in a situation where we can do less. Uh, I will talk a little more about property tax because that, that's an important component. It's the bigger component of how we fund public services in Texas. But um, here you see where the state gets its revenue. Um, the, uh, the, bi the biennial budget is, is um, what we're looking at here in the biennial revenue situation. Um, and this hasn't really changed since I've been looking at the, at the um, uh, budget for um, I worked at the controller's office in between working for that state rep and working for the center. But this is usually what you see every two years. Taxes make up about half of the money that the state can, can appropriate. Uh, federal money is about a third of the budget. So as much as you'll hear our congressmen and U.S. senators talk about getting, getting the federal government out of here and getting, letting us take care of ourselves, we really do need federal money to pay for our health care programs, foster care, child care, Almost everything in the job training and workforce development area, everything the Workforce Commission does, the Environmental Quality, and there are some parts of, of the state uh, budget that are almost entirely federally funded. Housing, housing is another big area that depends on federal money. But the, the big picture is what we're looking at here. Healthcare advocates will already be aware that in many cases for CHIP and Medicaid, we need to have those tax dollars, those, those dollars in blue. To, to, to get the federal matching money. So in some cases, cuts in taxes don't just lose us those dollars, they also lose federal matching dollars for CHIP and for Medicaid. Here, here again, we're going back to, to look at the bigger picture. Um, uh, Juan referred to, I mean, I'll admit it, there's not a whole lot of people that enjoy paying taxes. Um, it's something we do because it's better than the alternative, which are people who um, are unhealthy and uh, illiterate. <laughs> so it's like it's the price we pay to have a decent, a decent society. And the way that Texas decides to make us pay taxes is what you're looking at here. So this is taking those other monies out of it. We're not looking at tuition or <coughs> fines or investments that the state might have. This is just taxes that we pay uh, to local governments and to the state. So what you see, uh, if you're looking at the pie on the left, is that uh, local taxes make up more than half of this tax bill. If, if I were to take any of you at random out of the audience, you're paying more to your local governments than you are to the state. 55% versus 45%. And of that money that goes to the state, more than half of it is the state sales tax. Uh, if my colleague Dick Levine were here, he would tell you that being this dependent on the sales tax is bad for several reasons. Um, one, one major one is that with an economy so reliant on the sales tax and other consumption taxes like uh, oil, uh, like a gasoline tax, cigarette tax, and alcohol, um, most states ideally what you want is like a three-legged stool for a tax system, income, sales, and, and property taxes. What Texas has is a two-legged stool, and at the state level, because the state is really, really reliant on the sales tax. It, it's more of a pogo stick. I mean, it's like jumping up and down. Every time the economy goes down, it takes state services with it. So the state sales tax is also bad for another reason that especially hits Latino families hard. Um, but, but here, the main thing is so much of what we pay to the state is the sales tax. Locally, uh, property taxes are primarily for schools. More than half of the property taxes we pay are for schools. Um, this causes also a lot of issues, which the education uh, paper goes into in, in more detail. 
Uh, the other half roughly is allocated between cities, counties, and special districts. So well, what we argue about here, property taxes are important, but we understand the limited ability to pay, especially for people on a, on a fixed income. Um, but there, we're going to come out of the symposium with positive uh, uh, proposals. One is a uh, property tax circuit breaker. There are ways to make the property tax more, more, more tolerable. Another one is local optional homestead exemptions that are based on um, a flat dollar exemption instead of percentage. So there are ways to improve this, but this is what we're looking at right now. This is why it matters so much how we collect taxes. Here we're looking at a controller report that breaks all the families in Texas into, into quintiles, each, each fifth of Texas households is what you see here. So um, we're roughly 11 million households in Texas, so about 2.2 million in each of these brackets. The very top uh, fifth of families, up, up at the very top, is families in Texas. It could be one, one uh, income earner or a couple. But that's a family making almost $147,000 a year or more. So those of us in this room who are fortunate enough to be making that much, 4.5% of your income goes to pay state and local taxes. Now those at the very bottom here uh, are making less than $35,000 a year roughly. Um, almost 18% uh, almost of that family at the bottom is being is being um, paid is paying for state and local taxes, the sales tax primarily. A family making less than thirty five thousand dollars is buying groceries. Luckily, we don't collect sales tax on that, but they might eat out in a restaurant. They do pay sales tax. Clothing, um, soap, shampoo, anything that you buy for your household, you're going to pay sales tax. Furniture, sales tax. Um, Gasoline taxes, all pretty much everything that family down there buys is going to be is going to be taxed by the state. Um, they also are going to be paying uh, property taxes at the local level. So that family ends up paying um, that they have their, their their tax share is four times, almost four times as high as that family at the top. And uh, where do you think Latino families are most likely to be represented here? Based on what we just saw. Uh, I'm not going to surprise you, am I? Uh, a third, a third of Texas Latinos, also about a third of African Americans, are in this very bottom, bottom quintile. That's compared to less than 20% of Anglo households. Uh, so that means, again, just pick a Texas, Texas Latino randomly off the street. There's a 50/50 chance they're in this income bracket. This is this is a this is a a, a, a place where that tax system hurts you the hardest keeps you from moving up into the middle class, doesn't let you save, doesn't let you put money away for college, but all of that starts with our tax system. And um, it also makes it hard for legislators to get more money on the table because the way they're trying to do it now is trying to take it from the people who have the least. They're trying to pay their bills and don't have that much left over after that. So the resistance to tax increases is also because you're asking the people who have the least to pay the most. So that's, that's, a, that's the main challenge. Again, this, the tax cuts that we've had in 2015, the franchise tax, uh, which is only being paid at this point by businesses that have at least a million dollars a year in income, who do you think that tax cut helped? It did not help the families at the bottom. That one was for the top. The 2017 legislature is talking about completely getting rid of the franchise tax. Again, you only pay that if you make at least a million dollars a year from your business. They're talking about getting rid of it completely that would be an $8 billion cut to schools and to health care. Again, that's not going to be felt by the people at the very bottom. So the tax trend is going in exactly the wrong direction. Um, it affects this chart because we are already 47 in state spending per capita. We're actually average. We, we saw in the previous presentation how in some places Texas is exactly where other states are. Local spending is one of those. 25th in local spending per, per capita. Uh, but we're almost at the bottom, 47. And th this is from the Census Bureau, it's for 2014. A lot of other states decided to expand Medicaid, got a lot more federal money in their budget. So Texas did not do that. So this ranking by 2015, using another data source, we're 50. Uh, that is actually something that we've traditionally, we've been at the bottom five ever since I started looking at these numbers 25 years ago. 
but um, but the, the the way that that affects our schools and our healthcare funding is what I'll touch on real briefly um, in the next few slides. Again, this is this is this is in the paper, but there's a few slides that I especially want you to see those long-term trends that will help your other discussions. <coughs> Uh, this I won't get into as much. The main thing to know about the budget is you can't spend money you don't have. That's why I spent some time talking about our tax system. If we don't raise it in the form of taxes, then the legislature can't appropriate it when it's writing the budget for the next two years. And it is a legislative process. The governor will get in there and veto things at the very end. But for the most part, it's the House and Senate deciding what they want to do. And with a limited amount of money, they're, they're pretty much stuck with that. There is the rainy day fund that they can choose to use. We've been doing a lot of advocacy around that, but for the most part, it's that new incoming state tax revenue that, that's at stake. Um, this is what the budget looks like for the period we're in right now, 2016-2017 biennium. Uh, the part at the left is the part that has to balance, that depends on taxes. And unfortunately, the next budget is likely to be about the same amount. $206 billion might be as much as 108 but they don't have any more money to work with this time because of previous tax cuts and also choices to move some of the money to the highway fund. Uh, the, the, the pie on the, the, the um, right includes the highway fund and federal money. But the one on the other side, you see how uh, when we talk about improving the budget and, may, and the budget being a moral document, I tell people we, well, our, 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 our choices are in the right order. 39% uh, of the general revenue goes to pre-K uh, through 12th grade education. The session, some people want to divert that to vouchers. 39% is, is, is for public ed, 14% for higher education. So well over half of our, our bond money is clearly an investment in the, in the education of our children and young adults. Another 30% is that money I mentioned. It's got to, we have to use that money to match federal dollars from Medicaid and health care. Uh, foster care, other other programs, but that that right there, that's it, nobody could look at that and say we're choosing to put a bigger uh, value on public safety or something else. Um, but but when we don't have money because of tax cuts, that's also where where the reductions are going to happen. Federal money makes the Health and Human Service part look a lot bigger, 37 percent. But for the most part, uh, public education has always been, and most likely will continue to be, the single largest use of state tax dollars. Uh, this is in your paper, so I won't get into it too much other than to point out that um, I think in, in the, the education discussion, you'll, you'll be touching on how uh, staff diversity is, is a major issue in higher education. It's also an issue at the elementary through secondary level. Uh, compared to our students, who are 52%, I'm, I'm using the terms that are in the Texas Education Agency report to Hispanic, because it's the, the, the term that's used. Um, Hispanic students uh, became the majority, more than 50% of our, our student enrollment in 2011. Um, teacher uh, diversity has not really improved much. About 60% of, of teachers themselves are, are, are still uh, Anglo, uh, compared to about a fourth of, of, of staff teachers that are Hispanic. But this is the chart, I think, that speaks to what we heard earlier. Just at the time that we need our schools to serve students better, um, 2011 is the year here where we're spending about $11,237 state, federal, and local money. Add all, all that together, you get to $11,200 per student. Local money was already the single largest way we paid for students, that's the green line. Below that is state spending per pupil, and then way at the bottom you see what federal dollars did for our schools. But the main thing is 2011 is the recent peak in what we do for our students um, per student spending. It's also, again, the year in which uh, more than half of our students were, were Latino. So just at the time that they're the single largest group of kids in school, that's when the cuts are made. Um, in 2012, it was because of the, the, the economic recession, but legislators haven't ever gone back. They've let local property taxes go up. You see the green line going up here. The orange line goes down because we don't have as much state revenue as we used to. Uh, college students, we do see tremendous increases in enrollment both at the community college and public university level. Again, this is the, the public school and higher ed support from the budget is more than half of what we're doing. And it is, um, at this point, benefiting primarily um, 
in uh, community colleges, Latino students are the single largest group in higher ed. They're about to, they're about even with Anglo students right now. But the issue that will be discussed in greater detail is the trade-off. Uh, again, just as Latino enrollment is increasing, we see tuition deregulation and major cuts to public support for higher education. Uh, UT and A&M are big flagship universities get at less than a fourth of their money from the state budget at this point. And tuition and affordability and student loans, those are all things, again, that, that touch on what the state budget fails to do for our students and our families. Healthcare access is the one other big part of the budget. Uh, Health and Human Services is primarily Medicaid spending. This is a big picture look at where, where all Texans of all ages get their health coverage. Uh, luckily, uh, this part of our health insurance coverage that comes from private jobs or the military, we're not going to talk a whole lot about military and, and uh, uh, military civilian, um, um, that, what that does for, for Latinos, but it is important in health insurance. 65% of Texans get health care through private insurance usually associated with their job. So that leaves the other 35% to depend on Medicaid, Medicare, or to be uninsured. The reason I highlight the, the, the part, the 9% of all Texans who are uninsured and Latino is because that is actually a huge improvement since the last time I looked at these statistics. Back then, that piece was one and a half times as big as it is there. All of this is due to the Affordable Care Act. This, is, this shows huge gains in coverage for Texans. But the fact that it depends on the Affordable Care Act um, makes everybody at CPPP who works on this extremely worried and, and huge advocates for keeping the Affordable Care Act. Today, the Republicans in the House are trying to repeal it for the, I forget how many times they've tried. But, uh, but if you can do one thing today, call whatever congressman represents you and tell them they will. It just uh, uh, <laughs> They actually voted it. Okay. This is the Senate. The good news is we hear the U.S. Senate won't approve that. But, but this is the direct result of advocacy. And to lose, to lose the coverage that we have. I mean, that as I said, that's why CPPP was originally created. And um, yes, we. This is something that that affects so many other areas. I guess what. The reason we work on health and education is because students won't learn in school if they're sick, and then your health care as an older adult depends a lot on your educational attainment, so you, you really can't separate them out. But um, I'll touch real briefly on Medicaid and how it relates to the budget. Uh, after public schools, it is the, single, uh, the second largest use of state tax dollars. And as we saw earlier with those pyramids, remember how the Latino pyramid looked like this? Well, as the average age of Latinos, especially women, gets over 65, you're going to see this, this piece on the left, uh, the right here, I'm sorry, changing to be more and more uh, Hispanic. Uh, Medicaid enrollees that are adults, the, the reason that they're, they're, they're only like one out of four Medicaid enrollees, but they account for about two-thirds of the costs. So, makes sense. The older you are, the more likely you're going to either be a pregnant woman who qualifies for Medicaid coverage or a Texan who is elderly or has a disability. So two-thirds of Medicaid spending is for the smaller pie. The other ones, children, uh, CHIP and Medicaid, I'm combining them here, um, more than 60% are, are Latino kids, but they're pretty cheap to cover. $200 a month for a premium as opposed to about $1,200 a month for, for the premium coverage for those on the other side. But again, as more and more Latino especially women, get to be old enough to qualify for um, community care, home care. Um, if they don't qualify for those programs, then it's also likely they'll be the workers providing jobs, and they'll be the home care aides or home workers. So on one or the other side, they're, they're affected by state decisions about Medicaid. Just as in the public education chart, what we see happening in Medicaid as as the, as, as the enrollment becomes more and more Hispanic, um, the state is spending less and less per enrollee. Some, some of this is demographic. Children are cheaper, so more and more children means the cost comes down. But some of it is straight out cuts that have been made that affect access to doctors and therapists and other kinds of health care providers. So the two things in the budget that have, that have always been priorities um, and that are enrolling more and more people 
um, are also the areas where legislators are, are cutting because they have cut taxes. Um, one other chart, but actually, I'll skip ahead to this one. This is the important one because it sets the stage for what's going to be happening at the end of the session and beyond. The main thing is that legislators have really gone out of their way to figure out how to pay for highways and roads. Um, unfortunately, they've decided to do that by asking voters to approve constitutional amendments that mean money can only be spent on highways. So this session, the reason that cuts are being proposed to Health and Human Services and even to Public Safety are because $5 billion of taxes was dedicated by the very few people who actually voted for this to the highway fund. So $5 billion can't be spent on public ed and higher ed. In the next budget cycle, the one after that, there's another dedication of car taxes that kicks in. So this, the, these choices that legislators have made don't just tie the hands of the ones writing the 2018-2019 budget. The decisions go beyond that. Uh, public education, this is this is the budget um, conferees on Senate Bill 1 are going to be working out what, what is the House proposing and what is the Senate proposing, and they'll take, hopefully, the best of the two proposals. If they go with what the House wants to do for public education, there will be more money going to public schools per student. It won't be enough to keep up with inflation, but it's more than what schools are getting right now. The better proposal for higher education is also being made by the House. The Senate would would devastate, um, especially special items, which fund a lot of things um, that, that universities don't get funded through enrollment. So um, centers and, and small business development and other things that are freestanding institutes would see pretty big cuts under the higher ed proposal. We hope they go with the House. But both of them are talking about a pretty big cut to health and human services in the form of Medicaid. So again, this isn't, we hope it's not just because they want to do this or because they know that Latinos are pretty big enrollees in some of these programs. They just cut taxes and they keep cutting taxes. We don't think they're cutting taxes because they want to reduce that burden on the lowest income families. I'm not going to give them that benefit of the doubt. Uh, but the net, but then the net effect is, again, less money to invest on these areas. And um, the the way the budget gets written is a lot is a whole other presentation that I could that I could talk about. I think it will be touched on by the next panelist who who's going to talk to us about um, the political system. The budget itself is the extreme case of a, a process that's really closed to like three people. Three people are deciding this scenario, and who decides who's the speaker of the House of Representatives and the lieutenant governor. And, uh, and all of that. That's about the political process. So I think I'll stop there. Again, there's, there's more in your paper, how low we range, how long we've ranked very, very poorly. But I think the main issue comes back to we need a certain amount of tax revenue just to keep up with growth, roughly about 8% more every two years. Our legislature is trying to do something every single time they come back to Austin to make everybody compete and fight for the what's little that's left after those tax cuts take effect. So something that changes that equation is what well, we're trying to come up with some a new way to do this. Uh, we know we have to talk about the effect on families and people because nobody cares about taxes. We hope they care about people. So that's I'll leave it there. It's a lot to absorb right now, but I think the next speaker will help us kind of add that other element to the to setting the table. Thank you. Huh? We knew this uh, first part would be a little uh, hard to get through, right? Uh, sort of, it seems like it's a lot of bad news, but, but uh, you know, courage. Right? <laughs> so uh, the next portion of the next uh, presentation, again, dealing with sort of structural problems, deals with Latino uh, political power and policy change and the environment that we find ourselves in. Uh, the, this is part of the path to power, of course, is we mean uh, political power as well. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. Henry Flores from St. Mary's University, a distinguished research professor, um, to, be, to take over this uh, portion of the... Dr. Flores, thank you. Thank you, Roger and Rogelio and, and 
one for organizing this. This is a much needed uh, uh, symposium. Um, and if you think that was bad news, just wait till you finish hearing what I've got to say. <laughs> um, and I'm going to read some of this, and some of it I'm not going to read because I've, we, I've rethought some of this stuff in my head. A lot of what I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak about and present to you are I, thoughts and ideas that, that I've been working on since probably 1974. And um, I've written uh, two books that, that cover a lot of this particular material. Um, but, and it's also based upon my involvement in, in uh, the civil rights movement, voting rights litigation throughout the years, and um, just doing a lot of research and interacting with politicians uh, in various states across the nation. Everything, every, everything from Ku Klux Klan members to to um, some of the wealthiest men in the nation, and how they and listening to how they how they think about the political process and so forth. And then I, I suddenly concluded how far we we are removed from the reality of, of politics in the United States. To date, we've been able to make our presence known, but to little avail. This is particularly evident in the realm of state education policy. Nevertheless, education is only one of the areas important to the Latino community. As you can see from the agenda, we are focusing this symposium on not just education, but also labor force development, housing, and health and human services issues. These are just the issues that are the most pressing and obvious, and in the future, there will be many more that we'll be speaking to. The issues at the center of today's symposium were chosen because combined they make up the core of the Latino family bienestar. I will not go into detail as to the current state of Genestad. You've seen it already, because um, because you've seen it already. Uh, what what I will say is that in every category: education, labor force development, housing, health and human services, we lag behind other social groups in the state and far behind. As pointed out earlier, our poverty levels, income levels, employment rates lag behind those African Americans and Anglo's in Texas. My task here this afternoon is to try to identify some of the structural barriers that prevent us from, from really having a, a, a bigger impact, and also to help us all think about what it is we can do and what it is we should think about trying to do beyond what we're doing already. For many years, it's been assumed that political power is gained by electing individuals who agree ideologically with However, once in office, we find that our representatives can only marginally affect policy, and then it takes years for these meager changes to emerge. This occurs because of the basic structures that make up the state's governmental and political policy processes. Some of these structures are ideological in nature and almost immutable, while others are comprised of statutes, policies, and programs which can be changed or altered. Nevertheless, the alteration process is structured in such a manner as well uh, to make changes almost impossible without drastic intervention such as a federal lawsuit. And even then, this process, the legal, can be arduous. And as where did you know, Hosa, he was here earlier. He, had to oh, yeah. he stepped out for a minute, but you know, I, you can ask David about education, how, how many decades we've been suing the state over education funding and policy. and it, hasn't changed much. Anyway, uh, for purposes of this discussion, the barriers can be placed into three categories, ideological, political, and bureaucratic. Each category, in turn, has two facets. One, the way decisions are made, and two, the way the, 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 the institutions are structured. Let me take them one at a time, the ideological. Perhaps the easiest to discuss is the ideological barrier, or sets of barriers, uh, because they're the, they're, but they are also the most difficult, if not impossible, to overcome and require very disciplined and long-range strategies. The pr principal reason this barrier is almost impossible to overcome is simply because it is deeply embedded in every institution and within every person that works within those institutions. Our 
perceptions are driven, and the, and, and the perceptions of the, you think of this, think of the people in power, not just the politicians, the bureaucrats, the wealthy people in the nation who are looking at the system to try to manipulate it. Think of it through their eyes, because that's what you're dealing with. You think you're, 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 you're looking through their eyes in a, in a lot of different ways of how they see you how they see us, how they see society in general, and their place and roles in that society and structure. Our perceptions and their perceptions are driven by the way we are formed ideologically. And this formation begins in the family unit and is reinforced in our educational system, religious institutions, the media, our peer group, and within the working world that we live in every day. The ideological barriers allow each and every one of us to determine how we interact with persons of other races, genders, ages, nations, and also determine whether we view the world through broad or narrow lenses or some combination thereof. We form these ideological barriers principally in our childhood and carry them throughout our lifetimes, bringing them to bear in our workplaces and the political realm. The barriers also assist us in identifying <coughs> issues and problems. They help us identify what is a problem. They help us identify what is a problem that has to be dealt with in the public policy process. That's one thing. The second thing it does is they help us define what that problem is in such a way that we want to define it. Thirdly, it helps us identify how to deal with the problem. What is the policy solution for this problem? And then finally, the ideology helps us try to understand how to implement whatever we've identified to solve that particular problem. So in some cases, our ideological orientation, for you, you'll see a problem. For you, it won't be a problem, i.e. poverty. Poverty for a conservative, is the problem, as, as, as Rohilly already pointed out, poverty. poverty is defined by a conservative and, and our wealthy person sometimes as a fault of that individual. And they can work on it themselves. They can pick themselves up by their bootstraps. They can work and get out of it. After all, everybody does it every day. Poverty is not a problem. You don't need policies to deal with poverty. If you're a progressive, you see poverty as a an artifact, a natural artifact of the, of the entire economic system, which means that the economic system and the institutions in that, in that system are responsible for dealing with that problem. Two different perceptions of the same concept, two different ways of defining it, two different orientations towards how to approach the problem, etc. You can do it in almost every category, public education, health care, housing, employment, and so forth. The only way to change or dramatically affect the ideological barriers is to develop a multifaceted, long-term strategy at many levels. We must change the curriculum in schools. You ever wonder why it's so hard to get Mexican-American studies embedded in, 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 the, in the school system? Because Mexican-American studies bring our stories into the curriculum. They bring our community's needs into the curriculum. They teach young people that these are important to deal with, and they're going to end up in the public sector. They're going to end up maybe being owners of businesses or whatever. And when that generation comes to bear, they're going to be defining the public policy process completely different than it's being defined now. So curriculum, perceptions in the media, in the minds of policymakers at all governmental levels. One of the interesting uh, issues that I've been dealing with, and I've, I've started to make it part of my, my expert reports when it comes to civil rights cases, and um, I did it first in the uh, Section 5 hearing over the voter ID law that first declared the voter ID law unconstitutional in Washington, D.C. Uh, in 2013. Was uh, and when I got off the stand, somebody took me aside and they said, that's the first time I've ever heard Chicano studies used 
as a research methodological technique in, in a lawsuit. And I said, I thought about it for a while, and I said, you know what? I really hadn't done anything different other than tell our story. One of the ideological problems in American intellectuals' world and academia and in the legal system is that the, the concept of race that we're dealing with is, is a dual race concept, dual race theory. The, those in power see racial questions as black or white and black and, and relationships between black and whites. And so we end up, and our story ends up not being told, and we end up being invisible. So when I went on the stand, I told our story. I told our story to the judges about what life was in South, what was like in South Texas. I, I, you know, I took a lot of the work from David Montejano. I mean, you have to give him credit because he's the one that wrote the first real deep history that, that to be told. And um, and then I just carried it forth. And the judges asked me a lot of questions. And you'd be surprised how little they know or even hear about us. That's right. So that's what I mean by taking our story and making it into the forefront of the policy process. Because it's just not, we know it, and we know it down here in South Texas, but they don't know it in Washington. They refuse to hear about it in Austin. So part of the strategy is you have to tell this story. And telling this story is a long-term process. It's got to be told in the courtroom. It's got to be told in the classroom. It's got to be told in the whole halls of Austin. It's got to be told everywhere. The political barriers. That's one, the ideological world. The political barriers. The barriers created in the political world may appear obvious to some, but they are extensive because of the many-layered nature of our political system and the fact that generally power is diffused throughout the system. Sometimes it is difficult to identify which level of government is responsible for administering a given solution, the budget process, for instance, uh, within our community. As a result, it behooves the Latino community to develop a thorough understanding of, one, how government functions, and two, how government is structured. And I guess three, how the bureaucracy functions, and four, how it functions, how, it, how it's structured. So, this includes identifying the formal positions of power, the informal positions of power, what exactly they can do, where the boundaries of those powers are, um, and, and then trying to develop long-term strategies to, one, embed ourselves in the system as much as possible. So keep running political campaigns. Keep winning them as much as possible. Get in the bureaucracy. <laughs> start changing the bureaucracy from within. Um, folks often ask me, what are you doing directing a, a master's in public administration? I'm training Latino bureaucrats. That's what I'm doing. When you stop and think, we need people that work in there so we can uh, manipulate the process. And some of my students, I can see them doing things here and there and everywhere in, in funny, strange little ways that a lot of people just don't notice because bureaucrats are really, really important. But we need to be part of that, that structure as well. We need to educate our business folks, the young, young, young individuals that are going into the business world, because they develop a sense of conscience about who they are and the needs of our community. I was um, part of, uh, I was on the first board of, of uh, what's known as the Westside Development Corporation here in San Antonio and anchored partially here by UTSA and then St. Mary's and Our Lady of the Lake. And we did a, a really good study of the West Side. And one thing we discovered was how huge the, the economy is on the West Side. Two, we also discovered how huge that economy bleeds. Why? Because there are no businesses on the West Side for people to spend money in. So the money leaves the community and ends up on the North Side. So that's where people have to go to shop. So our Latino business folks have got to learn to start investing in our community and develop, you know, an infrastructure, financial business infrastructure within our community. Sure enough, I've been teaching that for a number of years, and you go to some of the branches of the banks on the west side, and they're my, my graduates are in there working, making loans and trying to encourage them, but folks to do business there, but they still bleed. That's got to be, and I think the, the beloved Choco Mesa, 
did a study a number of years ago also looking at the informal economy of the West Side and discovered just a bunch of small businesses that nobody even thinks about. They're almost like operating under the radar. And the amounts of money in those tire shops, paleterias, and just go on and on and on, there's money there and people working and generating jobs and doing this and the other and we're not taking advantage of it and developing it in, in bigger ways. So get, get Latinos in office, get Latinos in the public policy process, get Latinos into the business circle, but with a conscience that, that, that can bring solutions to our needs into, into the world. Third area, decisional processes. Oh, these are amazing because I sat down and tried to enumerate them, and I'll just give you an example of some of them. Laws, statutes, policies, procedures, parliamentary regulations, precedents, customs, traditions, and it goes on and on and on. Some are formal, formalized, they're written, statements are there and everywhere, some are not. You just word of mouth think we've been doing it this way forever kind of thing. Fundamentally, these barriers are designed to create conservative policies and laws that generally are not designed to completely solve a problem or thoroughly address an issue. I'll give you a good example of this. When the voter ID law was first proposed, Senate, Senate Bill 14, the informal laws and rules of the state Senate, the governor's office, and the state house were used to fast track that legislation and just shove it down people's throat. The only people that were able to even stop it momentarily were, were uh, some Latino legislators and, and one black legislator uh, on March, March 23rd, 2011. Take a look at that date in the House Journal, one of the most revealing dates in the history of the, of the state legislature. And our guys, they held them up. They tried 67 times to amend the doggone thing. Five times there were, there were attempts to, to point out to the leadership of the House that maybe this law violated the federal law or the Voting Rights Act. And the responses were incredible. We don't care. That's not our responsibility to think about those kinds of things. And, you know, just arrogance. Just, uh, and they tried, but they, could, they, could, they couldn't obviously overcome it. So, you know, it, it went to the federal court. And, uh, later, and we're still dealing with it, but, but still, those rules that allowed them to manipulate the legislative process, you know, are, are an example of, of, of some of these things I'm talking about. Embedded within the decisional process are something that I've, I've come to identify as filtering systems. There's three of them. The first one, is a combination of ideological, political, kind of bureaucratic. And it's one that, that's really kind of insidious and, and, and we just don't even think about it, really. But the first filtering system is designed, or mechanism, is designed to exclude, exclude any ideas that are deemed inappropriate politically and socially to a given culture. I'll give you an example. Remember the housing bubble, 2008? Do you remember how it almost destroyed the economy of the nation? Do you remember how many people lost their homes? Do you, can you tell me how many bankers went to prison? None. Do you know how many banks were nationalized because of that and forced to obey laws? We don't talk about the nationalization of banks, and we don't talk about sending bankers to do some hard time. You know, some of these guys have been sent to Attica. When they came out, they'd be thinking about all kinds of different things. <laughs> you know, they would be thinking about their sins, like, oh, how did I end up here? But no, we don't do that. We don't teach that in business schools. We don't teach it, we don't, lawyers don't talk about these kinds of things. We don't talk about it in intellectual academic circles. We don't talk about it in the normal course of everyday life. Nationalization, nationalization of banks is something that a third world country or some past communist society would think of doing, but not us. That's what I mean by, that's an example of the first type of exclusion mechanism, 
fil our system filters out ideas like that. They're just not socially acceptable, politically acceptable. The second mechanism takes the remaining policy alternatives and either waters them down through the, through the decision-making process, deal-making, bargaining, trade-offs, whatever they want to do. You ever, you ever notice how laws get passed? I'll tell you what. Why? I'll do this for you tomorrow if you do this for me today. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't go with you in this piece of legislation, says, says uh, Congressman so-and-so to the lobbyists, but you can count on me next time. My constituents won't stand for it. And they go on and on and on. Line drawn here, line drawn there, and the, by the time you get the piece of, of, of legislation that's passable, it's been watered down and gutted for the most part. That's a second filtering type of mechanism that, that exists in society. And then the third one is accepting a policy that is acceptable to all the powers that are. You know my favorite one? <clears throat> Monday, Monday, there was a press conference here in San Antonio about the Mission Trail uh, community. Um, it, you know, the Mission Trail community, for those of you who are not from San Antonio, is a, was a mobile home park of, of residents of people who had lived there for a long, long time, um, uh, just, just south of downtown San Antonio, really, uh, on the near south side. And um, some developer decided he was going to put a development in, worked with the council member, they did all kinds of this, and the, the landowner sold the land, and the people were removed from their homes. Monday was a report on, on what their status is today. Some are homeless, and some died of, of grief, and just went on and on. I mean, the, the people, nobody cared about what happened to the people. Nobody really cared. All they cared about was a policy that gave that developer a shot at, at building a nice high-rise, another high-rise set of apartments for the millennials that are trying to attract San Antonio. Uh, I'm not, you know, I don't want to denigrate the millennials. My daughter's a millennial, and she'll, she would kill me if I, she ever talked like that. But still, she understands what I, what I, what I have to say. Um, what's, the, what's the status of that development now? Zero. It's just a vacant lot. I don't even know if their development's going to go in there, but people's lives were destroyed because of some speculation that they were going to do something for economic development purposes. Those are the kinds of policies. If you don't like that one, how about Chavez Ravine? You know where Dodger Stadium is? Los Angeles Dodgers? How many Latino communities were destroyed to put that stadium there? Three. Latino railroad workers, they destroyed just a whole three huge barrios from there just to put that stadium in, just so the Dodgers could have a nice place to play their game, right? It was economic development. They drew, they used that, that, that promise to bring the Dodgers from Brooklyn, New York, to Los Angeles, California, to help build the economy of LA. And it can go on and on and on. You find a lot of these examples in economic development areas, but you also find them in the worlds of of uh, education policy, healthcare policy. Look at look at the uh, look at the policy surrounding uh, drugs that deal with uh, uh, cancer or, or diseases that are very difficult, that are very 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 uh, uh, very rare. Pharmaceutical companies aren't going to put put a lot of money into them. Why? They're not going to make any money on them. So they just won't. If they produce them, they produce them, and they're extremely expensive. And where's the government in all of this? People's lives depend upon some of these drugs, but then the government says, oh, this is a free market. It's a market of forces are going to take care of all that sort of stuff. And bye. We, we, our, health, our health suffers. So that's a third sort of, of filtering mechanism. Unfortunately, the thoughts in, that, that I've, I've talked about and presented to you today, it's really food for thought. It's like, as I said before I started my presentation, these are ideas that I've, I've come, up, come up with and thought about over a long period of time throughout my, my academic career. And the challenges are almost formidable. But as I said, the way to think about these 
or in, in, in long term, in the long term. There was a, there was a famous 19th century uh, social activist and, and political economist who one time was asked about, well, how long does, does it take change to occur? He says, you know, that's impossible to predict. It could be, it could come tomorrow, it could come in two weeks, it could come in a month, it could come in, in a year, it could, it, it, you know, who knows? The important thing is to just keep working at it, working at it diligently, working at it with passion, and just keep working at it. And what we need to do is think about it in those terms, passionately, in the long range, at all different types of levels, in all different sectors, education, political, media, whatever. And it'll take time. We can change the system, but, you know, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of commitment, and, and folks to, to just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, prior to taking a short break, uh, for about five minutes, stretch, you know, get some water, etc. Uh, I just want to mention and pick up on this last couple of words from Henry, long term. And But I want to add to it, and I said earlier, and as we talked uh, at the beginning, introducing the symposium, in terms of asking you to kind of set aside your focus day to day. And part of that is connecting with Henry said, how can we take long term? But I also still feel real strongly in terms of raising the question, food for thought, if you will, as we get it later on into the uh, breakout groups and the discussion panels, is are we working on the right priorities at the right time? And in sufficient ways with even what resources we have? And I know that's a hard question, but I'm thinking of it, if I'm the Familia Flores down the street you know, what are my priorities today as familia? Si tengo comida, do I have insurance? You know, do I have a, a living wage? You know, so I would just, as one example, say, how many of us here are fighting for a minimum wage? That tomorrow has more immediate effect, or at least six months from now or a year from now, versus I know we're working in education on changing the curriculum, and if we do it tomorrow, that's great and we should be successful, but that's a little bit more of a long-term investment in terms of what's going to come out and be influenced by that. So it's just trying to strategize a little bit between that long-term, which we need to, but also in terms of the short-term and what can we match, and how closely are we really in line with familias and where they're at. I know we work day to day and we're running and we feel from our perspective, we know where, where our familias are, but I'm not always totally confident that we are relative to their priorities and what they deal with day to day. But, uh, and so that's just food for thought. And why don't we take a short break, take about five minutes, and then we, I'd like to do a, a few summaries in terms of our discussion papers and move on to our panel. <laughs>